Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Erin Garcia, and I'm the Director of Exhibitions and Engagement at the California Historical Society. Welcome to our program, African American Family History and Reparations in California, with panelists Nika Sewell Smith, Jonathan Burgess, and Chris Lodgson. Before we do anything else, I'd like to acknowledge that the California Historical Society is headquartered in San Francisco in the unceded territory of the Ramatouche Ohlone. It is our job at CHS to not only remember this fact, but also to make California's rich, complicated, and diverse past a meaningful part of contemporary life. We do this through public programs like this one, through our research library and collections, and by hosting exhibitions. Our current exhibition is Mapping a Changing California, Selections from the 17th to the 20th Century. Our galleries at 678 Mission Street are open Thursdays and Fridays from noon to 5.30 p.m., so please visit us. There are some quick housekeeping matters that we need to attend to before we move on to our program. First, I need to tell you that this program is being recorded. A video will be available on our YouTube channel in the next few days. We are delighted to be presenting this program to you live, and we will be taking questions at the end. Please use the Q&A feature, which is located at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can. For any comments or conversation during the program, please use the chat box. I see you're already doing that. Um, that's also located at the bottom of your screen. Um, we are thrilled to see so many of you here tonight, and we want to continue bringing programming like this, but we need your help to do so. So in a few moments, we're going to launch a brief poll. Your participation helps us access important grant funding for programs like this one. So the poll consists of just a few questions. It's completely voluntary and anonymous, and we will not share the results with the audience. When we launch the poll in just a moment here, you'll have about two minutes to answer the questions. Um, please be sure to hit the submit button at the end. Um, okay, so we are going to go ahead and launch the poll. Um, let me see here. Here we go.
Thank you so much. Um, now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Um, Nika Subal smith is a host, consultant, and documentarian with more than 20 years experience as a genealogist. She has extensively researched the enslaved and their communities and is an expert in genealogical research along the Mississippi Delta. Smith has been interviewed in numerous publications and has appeared on the Today Show, CNN, MSNBC, and an episode of the series, Who Do You Think You Are? She is the host of Black Pro Gen Live, an innovative web series focused on the genealogy and family history of people of color in the U.S. Jonathan Burgess is chief officer, is a chief officer with the Sacramento Fire Service, a culinary genius, an entrepreneur, an innovator, and an activist and advocate for the African American slash Black American community. He is the author of the children's book Burgess Gold Rush Descendants and the founder of the California African American Gold Rush Association. Gold Rush, Gold Rush Association. <laughs> That's a tongue twister. Um, a nonprofit organization. Jonathan speaks publicly on entrepreneurship, California Gold Rush history, and genealogy. Chris Lodgson is a lead organizer with the Coalition for a Just and Equitable California, CJEC, the American Redress Coalition of California, ARCC. I think you're going to be hearing more about those organizations tonight. They're both grassroots or grassroots California-based organizations working for reparations and reparative justice for descendants of U.S. chattel slavery living in California. Chris is also a political advocate for Sacramento Black-owned businesses, as well as an entrepreneur who runs Sacramento County's largest directory and digital marketing platform for local Black-owned businesses. Welcome, Nika, Jonathan, and Chris. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're going to start with Nika. Hi, thank you everyone for joining us for this session this evening. I won't be before you long uh, because we have a lot of information we'd like to get to. Um, and of course, this is going to be a fairly quick review of uh, just the basics of genealogy and family history research. One of the things that people often think is that in order to research the formerly enslaved or to research Black people um, who may descend even from people, free people of color living in the United States, you need a special keyboard, a special monitor, you need a special brain to do that. And in fact, that is not the case. Um, if you have the basic skills of doing basic genealogy, that can be replicated across populations of people. The only challenge or the only potential road bump depends on the time period in which you're looking for things. And that really is the case all over the place. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right, so um, let's get started. We're gonna talk about beginning genealogy. And again, once you learn the basics of genealogy, you can apply them to different groups. But the thing with African-American populations is that you have to pivot around the time period of 1865. And that's a crucial one because that's right when the Civil War was ending, 13th Amendment abolished slavery except in the instance of punishment for a crime. And our ancestors, those of us who descend from um, those who were formerly enslaved are moving into their lives as free people and they're walking into that new identity um, that they are having in records. And so you have to factor that in as you start to look through things. So basic definitions, just to get us started, what in the world is genealogy? Of course, it's the study of family pedigrees. It's an account of the descent of a person, family, or group from an ancestor or older forms. And it's really lineage focused. When you think the she begat, 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 he begat, right? The nuts and bolts, the dates, the locations, all of those sort of facty things that factor into our individual family stories are what make up genealogy. And these are things that if you are trying to just preserve the legacy of your family, or if you've been following efforts in the state of California with regard to reparations or even across the country, because a lot of cities, you know, like Detroit, Boston, Atlanta, are uh, you know, creating task force and commissions uh, to look at reparational programs. Or if you're in San Francisco, you may be even following the task force there. Genealogy on its face is fact-based. What can we prove based on records? What can we prove that's based on paper? But what happens between those facts is what's called family history. And that's the space that I personally like to live in. It's the study of past events related to a group of people 
who are related to each other, a person's children, or a group of related people, including people who lived in the past. And family history is the dash between the birth and the death date, or the dash between the birth date and the, and the marriage date. The, the, the why, how did those folks come to live in that location? Why did that person work that job? Why did we move? All of those things are, you know, what family history, and yes, they're based in facts, but a lot of times you're gonna have to read between the lines based on the paper trail that was left behind, as well as what we can gather and glean from our family members who were living with some of our elders when they were walking the earth, or just what you find in the pursuit of your genealogy and family history research. So the first step is number one, you're going to start with yourself. And what that means is you're going to start with what you know and what you remember about your family. And notice I did not say to go online and begin searching first. The reason why I don't suggest this is because we often overlook the living resources that we are as well as those that exist in our families. And when we do that and, and, and you know, completely surpass that and, and head online, what ends up happening is that when you realize you need to have those conversations, when you realize you need to really think about what you know, a lot of the people that you could have reached out to have passed away. So just so we can control for that and make sure that that does not happen, you want to go through what you remember. You want to document what you know going back as far as you possibly can. For some people, this may just be back to their parents. For others, it may be that they know great-grandparents. Maybe they know uh, great-great-grandparents. Regardless, choose the means that you can use. You can print out a basic pedigree chart online. Um, you can start filling in your family tree based on what you know using um, genealogy websites. You can even start with a basic piece of paper or maybe if you don't like writing, you could even use a voice memo on your phone so that you can just free flow and, and basically brain up all the information that you have. You also want to reach out to your parents if they are still living, as well as relatives or individuals that we call fictive kin. Those could be individuals who are close to your family, but they're not biologically related to you. I call this the proverbial Aunt Cheryl. She's the lady that has been around for your entire life. She knows everyone in your family, knows all the business, all the things. And in fact, sometimes when you reach out to those fictive kin, those individuals may remember details about your family that folks that you are more closely related to don't remember or in some instances refuse to share with you. So again, the first start starting point is to make sure that you start with what you know from what you remember and then document going back as far as you possibly can, dates, locations, names, even if it's a nickname, even if you don't know what Medea's name is, it doesn't matter. Write her down, write down the basic information. And you also want to go through that process with your parents, your relatives, and your fictive kin. So once we leave the this, this step one, which is capture step, we're then going to move together. And again, we're not going to head online to search yet. The reason why, again, is because in addition to us potentially ignoring the living resources we have, being ourselves and our family members that remember some of these people, we also are neglecting the home repository or the home library. Consider you and your family to be the institutional experts on your family. What does that mean? That means that you all know what happened, you know who the people were, and even if you don't have a lot of information, you do have something. And what you're going to do is you're going to go through your home and you're going to gather documents from your home as well as relatives' homes that add to the family story, that help you fill in the, fill in the blanks. Things like funeral programs, birth, marriage certificates, death certificates, newspaper clippings, yearbooks, basically anything you can think of could be a genealogical source. And a lot of times what happens is that um, when we look at these documents in, in their totality, we realize that there may be little clues or crumbs that our ancestors or family members left behind that we didn't necessarily know offhand. And it could just be a mention of a specific place. Maybe you only know a, a, you know, a state as opposed to a parish or a county to look in for your ancestors. Again, there are certain things that in tra tracing my own family tree that I got stuck or at a brick wall and I was relating, you know, trying to, to figure out how to how to how these individuals were connected to me and there was nothing online that was telling me what I needed to tell me but when me and my family members began to search our homes and to go through documents and connect with other family members we actually found the proof that we needed to connect the two families so again start with what you know 
start with what your family members know. And then the second step is to gather documents and, and ephemera from your home to add more color. And then from that point, that's when you're gonna start in search, okay? That's when you're gonna start in search. People ask me all the time what the best website is to research African-American genealogy. And of course, you've probably heard of Ancestry, which is a site where accounts are free. Um, there are free trials for up to two weeks. Um, there are a lot of collections that are available uh, for free, but some of the collections do require a subscription. The other part about Ancestry is that most public libraries do have institutional access. So you can go into your public library and access Ancestry for free and get access to records. Additionally, you also have FamilySearch.org, and this is a free site. Uh, accounts are free and access to records are free. Um, for the most part, there is a certain set of records that you can only access when you go into a family search library, which those exist over the country. And there are, is some overlap between Ancestry and Family Search. Um, some of the record collections are exactly the same. Some of them are different. They may have a couple more years on Ancestry versus a couple less years on Family Search and vice versa. In addition, we're also going to go anywhere where the records are. And in the context of the conversation we're having tonight, we're talking about reparations and we're talking about tracing enslaved people. And not one website has every single record relating to enslaved people. You are going to go anywhere where you can find the evidence that is going to corroborate your family's connection to enslavement. Additionally, my suggestion is that you start with the 1950 census. And the reason why I suggest this is this is the census that is the most recently released. Yes, we did one in the year 2020, but there is a privacy hold, a 72 year privacy hold on the United States census, which means that you can only get access to 1950 until the year 2032, which is when we get the year 1960. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna look for someone in your family, which it could be you or it could be parents, grandparents or whoever, who was alive as of April 1st of 1950, and you're gonna try to locate them on the census. And since you've already gone through the, you know, the recesses of your mind, you've talked to your relatives, you've also gathered documents, you should have a good idea at this point where folks were living in 1950. And I'm from California, so I know and I understand you have to factor in the Great Migration. Many of us who are here in this space likely have ancestors who had migrated to the state of California by 1950, or maybe right thereafter. So you may be looking for them in Oakland. You might be looking for them in, in LA. Maybe your grandfather was in the Navy and they were in San Diego. Either way, you're gonna try to find individuals on 1950, and then you're gonna to continue to go backward every 10 years. Since the census takes place every 10 years, you're gonna go from 1950 to individuals living in 1940 to individuals living in 30, 20, 10, 1900. You see how we just went through the 20th century that quickly. And remember, you're not gonna look for folks who weren't alive as of a certain census date. You're gonna see individuals and households and you're gonna you know, look for anybody who's 10 years of age or older to try to find them on the previous census. You're gonna take that, you're gonna take that step until you get back to 1870. Now, the unfortunate part is that the 1890 census burned, so we have to jump 20 years from 1880 to 1900, okay? Which for some families, it's a complication because if you had someone who was born during that time period, you're not gonna find them on the census. But don't fret, that's where additional records come into play. We're also, again, as you search your home and you look for vital records and documents and things, you're also going to try to find those things online. There are state level uh, death indexes, marriage indexes, uh, birth indexes, or even sometimes the certificates that you can find on websites like Ancestry and Family Stuff, as well as things like military records, yearbooks, you name it, you can almost pretty much find it online. Now, what you're going to do is when you go online and search, you're really just filling in the blanks for this, for the stuff that you did not know personally, that your family didn't know, and that the documents and things that were in your possession did not know. Now, more suggestions here. Focus on one family line at a time. A lot of times, the, you know, names were common. You always had a Mary and a Martha who were a set of sisters, or when you get into the baby boomer generation, there's gonna be a million Barbaras. <laughs> Make sure that you um, focus on one family branch at a time. And it could be that your family 
converges in a specific, you know, small town somewhere. And that's fine. It's just you want to stay focused. Usually what I do is I keep going in one, on one branch until maybe it seems like I've hit a lull and then I might switch gears and head to another one. Something that I will also point out is that as much as we are wedded to spelling, you also have to remember that in genealogy, a lot of times it does not count. We have to remember that literacy rates, you know, people being able to read and write at the level at which we can read and write now was not always the case. And a lot of times people's names would be written phonetically, even if it sounds like, well, this doesn't make any sense why they would spell the last name King wrong. No, that name could be butchered in records. So what you're looking at are additional details for your family groups that tell you that you have the right people. You know, are the mother and the father the same? Are the names of the children the same that are within the household or associated people? Is the race correct? Because here's the thing, you might see a family that appears to be the family that you're looking for, but the race is not marked in the way that it needs to be. Um, and so you want to pay attention to that because race was marked on records. You also don't want to be entirely too tied to race because sometimes people will see the term mulatto and then make an assumption. Oh, that means that um, we we'll just make a bunch of assumptions based on that. And I can tell you, my grandmother was on a census um, marked as mulatto because her mother was was very fair skinned. And when I told her that she laughed because she couldn't believe it because she never um, she never identified as that. So be sure to note racial identifiers for people because sometimes that will aid you in your research. You also want to go ahead and read everything. Do not skip over columns and all that stuff. On the U.S. Census, we have information in every single column. Remember, demographical data for our country is being generated by these records. So that means that they had to use all the available real estate on those pages to document things. You're going to learn things about whether those individuals that you're looking at were, were literate, whether people served in the Civil War, uh, the occupation they had, how many hours a week they worked, all of that kind of stuff. Every document, be sure to go through and read everything. And lastly, you can use DNA as a backup. A lot of people think that you can just take a DNA test and that's going to give you all the answers when in fact it actually creates more questions than answers usually. Using DNA as a backup is, um, especially if you've opted into DNA matching where your test is compared to all the other people who have tested and it tells you a degree of relatedness where it can even narrow down who specific ancestors are based on your family tree and the family trees of your matches, that will validate the paper trail um, that you're looking at. All right, so this is just a quick review before I close out. I want to remind everyone that every generation that comes from, um, that you descend from, the number of ancestors doubles. So if we have four grandparents, we have eight great grandparents that are the parents of those grand grandparents. And you've got 16 great, great grandparents, 32 great, great, great grandparents, and 64 great, 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 great grandparents. And in the, you know, the process of talking about reparations, you have to also think about where slavery began on your respective family tree. And that can be all over the map. For me, my enslaved ancestors began at my great great grandparents, whereas someone else who's watching their enslaved ancestors could begin at their great 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 grandparents. And when you factor that in, the amount of years between generations in your family, it could you know it could really determine how many documents and how far back you have to actually go. And just going back to your four times great grandparents, that's 124 different people. Factor in as well, if individuals have an interest in tracing their family history back to Africa, you have to remember that the transatlantic trade again starts at different time points for everyone. For me, my transatlantic slave trade ancestors, those people who survived the Middle Passage begin at my five times great grandparents. That's not even on this slide. And those individuals didn't just come from the same exact place in Africa. They could have come from 20 places in Nigeria and maybe five in Ghana and, and, and vice versa. So just keep that in mind. So I'm going to go through a couple documents before I end because I really want to drive home um, uh, an important point. A lot of Americans are wanting to get back to a document that's just like this. And this is a list of, or manifest of alien passengers 
uh, for U.S. immigration officer at the port of arrival, right? These are people who are coming into New York as immigrants. And many, again, many people are trying to find what are considered their quote unquote Ellis Island ancestors. And on these ship manifests, and this one is from 1906, you see information such as the name of the individual, you see their age, you see their gender identity, um, their calling or occupation, their nationality, where they were last living, their final destination, um, whether they had money in their possession, who was receiving them, whether they were literate, and then some archaic stuff like, were they a polygamist or an anarchist, or did they have physical disabilities? And while, again, many Americans can get back to a list like this, what I want to drive home is that one of these lists for enslaved people, for all enslaved people who were brought during the transatlantic slave trade, or even all enslaved people in the United States does not exist. I'm going to repeat what I just said. There is no central list of all enslaved people in the United States. It doesn't exist. More likely, when you start to go through documents, it's going to look like this. You are going to get all the demographical information, all those, those fields that I just laid out. You're going to get that, but the names are going to be missing. Now, some of you may be wondering, why is that? And what, was there ever an opportunity to gather that data? Well, in fact, yes, there was. There were two opportunities to gather this data. The first exists on the separate schedules of enslaved people that was a part of the United States Census. Now, enslaved people were counted in terms of numbers beginning in the first census in 1790. But in 1850, in preparation for the 1850 census, Congress decided to collect more granular demographical data on enslaved people. And the original iteration of the slave schedules, instead of where it says names of slave owners, it actually had name of slaves. And that would have stayed that way. This would have created a national sort of list of enslaved people. But there was a, a senator from South Carolina named Andrew Pickens Butler. And on the floors of our Congress, he argued, and I quote, the census heretofore taken has only required the numbers of slaves, and I see no useful information the obtaining of the names can afford. On a plantation where there are one, two, or 300 slaves, there are perhaps several of the same name and who are known simply by some familiar designation on the plantation. It can afford no useful information and will make a great deal of labor, which technically doesn't make sense because they had to go in and category, they had to, they had to get their age, gender identity, their race, whether they are fugitive of the, of, of the state, whether they had been freed, and whether they had a physical disability. All of that information had to be counted, but he argued that adding the name was going to make it no. And so Congress moved forward and removed or edited where it says name of slave owners, where should have, that should have said name of slaves and name of slave owners was put there. So the slave schedules in effect is nothing more than a census of slaveholders and their wealth. And of course, I'm not showing you just any random slave schedules. I'm showing you the one for the Senator that argued filling in the names was gonna be too much labor. He enslaved 64 people in Edgefield County, South Carolina. So this decision, was made in 1850 and it was made in 1860. So we had two opportunities. Our elected officials had two opportunities to create what we what would be, you know, we'd be using now as a national slave list. They had two opportunities to do that and they chose not to. So what do we have to use in that stead? Well, we have things like deeds and conveyances, which are property transactions between two parties. And this one, which is from Mississippi, you see enslaved people listed by name, but in, in, in transactions and in deeds and conveyances, sometimes the enslaved aren't even named. A lot of times they are, but then sometimes when they are, like when this in this example, their ages are not listed. But we at least know, like in this example, Negro men slaves named Cook, Ben, Dick, Tom, Hardy, Frank, Peter, Charles and Jake, 
Negro women slaves, Sophia, Charlotte, Luiga, Poella, Kowamba, and the children slaves, Jack, Sophia, and Lucy, right? At least we have a, a ballpark figure on their ages that connect them to their former slaveholders. We also have things like probates and successions. When a slaveholder passes away and had property, and enslaved people could be listed on the will, they could be listed on the inventory. In this example, you see item two Negro, King, age 55 years, his wife, Rachel, age 55 years, William, age 19 years, and Anne, which is short for Andrew, at 15 years, who were assessed with the value of $4,500 on this inventory from 1862, which literally in the throes of the Civil War. And for those that doubt that these records exist, I descend from King and Rachel. Those are my great, great, great grandparents. And if you go further down on the same list, little King who was age 25 is my great, great grandfather. This is my grandmother's grandfather on an inventory of enslaved people. Additionally, we also have records such as shift manifests. Once the importation of, of uh, African people directly from the continent into the United States was banned in 1808, in order for you to transport enslaved people by water in the United States, you had to have a manifest. Now, these manifests are great, but not everyone exists. This is an example from, um, for a ship going from Mobile, uh, to, from New Orleans to, uh, I'm sorry, from Mobile to New Orleans. And it documents a woman who is 21 years of age named Esther, who is five feet tall, who was enslaved by a man named George Little, and a little four-year-old boy named Ben, who was also enslaved by George Little. Additionally, we have other resources such as the Freedmen's Bureau, which we could stay, we could stay three weeks talking about the Freedmen's Bureau, but that is an entity that operated largely from 1865 to 1872. And in some locations, it operated earlier where the name of slaveholders are listed directly. This is a list of rations from 1867. And if you notice, highlighted in yellow are two 100-year-old people, which means that they were born about 1767, which is before the founding of the United States. Now, I can keep going, but we have plenty of other stuff that we can talk about. But what I want you, uh, those of you who are watching, to really think about and focus on is if you are trying to just do a legacy project for your family, to preserve your family's history, to find out who enslaved your ancestors, to do that for posterity, or if you um, are trying to prepare for efforts uh, regarding atonement and reparations, using documents and things with direct proof is going to make your life so much easier. Now, granted, it can be a challenge to get to these records um, in terms of clues and other things, but I'm telling you, if you get the, the basics of genealogy down, you can get there. Thanks. Thank you so much. That was really powerful. Um, we are now going to hear from Jonathan Burgess. All right. Um, wow. Thank you for that. Uh, incredible. So that was a lot that Nika shared, and I'm going to share with you, everybody here, just kind of my journey um, and life story of a lot of what she said is true when we look at African American uh, genealogy, researching who our family is. Um, as everybody mentioned, Jonathan Burgess, that, that is my name. Um, I am here uh, to share with you what I know about my family, which has been about a three or four year project. And uh, hopefully it will give you some tips, tricks, and clues as you begin your research on your ancestors. A couple of things. Um, the African American Donor Association that was inspired based on my ancestor. You can see uh, in the middle here, uh, that's said to be my great grandfather. Well, as history would show, might be the great great grandfather, depending on what time the picture was taken. But again, this is just one item of one of those documents that Nika spoke about a newspaper clipping a picture that can share with you who you are. So, oral narrative um, is important, and that ties into family history. 
Why is that important? Well, I'll tell you. Um, most African Americans couldn't read and write. Those that could read and write, uh, well, they didn't even tell you everything that they knew. As you read this autobiography, and this is part of an oral narrative um, that's been with my family since the Bible and the portrait came with it. Um, so a very important person in our family. This autobiography detailed the life of who we were told was our great grandfather. Now, as history shares, you know, one thing that I learned in history is that it continues to evolve. And as novice or historians, or uh, we have a responsibility to build on that history and make it more accurate and correct. And we build on it with primary documents, such as this. This is authentic autobiography that was left in the Bible. And the name is Nelson Bell. What I want you to clue in on here, and what I said earlier is that, you know, some people couldn't read and write, and even those that could didn't tell everything. Um, as the oral narrative would go in my family, this individual, this ancestor, wanted his family and his children to know who they were and where they came from. That's a story my mother shared with me. Um, and my mother, uh, like most women, are, 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 are powerful and the, and the matriarchs making sure this history follows. Um, and so if you read this document, it talks about being born in Mecklenburg, Virginia. Um, this man, this ancestor, lists every slave owner by name. It's powerful. What he doesn't do is he doesn't list his wife and family. He says, my wife and children. He says, my wife and family. Talks about a Mr. Finch near Washington. He talks about uh, uh, a, uh, another slave owner, you know, not after his, uh, that his family went to in Louisville, Kentucky. And so he never mentions, but I've researched this. And so although his timelines may have been off, John Gregory, yes, he did in fact have slaves. And yes, he was killed in the American Revolution about 1816. And this plantation was broken. So there's authenticity to what was written here. Now, the secret is, and I want to prepare you guys, as you begin to do your own research, you'll find that secrets are kept. And to my European brothers and sisters that are watching this video, I'll say this. Um, families keep secrets for a reason. Secrets kept from African Americans are for protection. Same thing goes for Europeans. And so, although Nelson Bell writes about his slave owners. He never tells who his family is. Doesn't list sex, age, any of that. But he knows who they are. As we would move on and talk about secrets. This Bible, again, authentic. If you see pictures of Bibles as you begin to do your research, right? This Bible contained documents. This autobiography was inside of it. In addition, there were deeds. Uh, there were death. Well, death dates of important people. Actually, some people that I found connected to the Underground Railroad. On the inside of this Bible, William Burris, his name is written in there. Now, William Burris is on my other side, and his brother Samuel, if you know about him, they were very profound and worked within the Underground Railroad. And so this stayed in our family, again, passed down the oldest son. Uh, I eventually got it because I had my brother look into it after we began the research. My mother told me once is that one day you'll be happy that I kept this information and wrote this stuff down. So for those of you that are beginning to do your research, just like they could say, go and talk to your elders. Why? Elders, whether it's auntie, uncle, whoever, they have information and unless you ask them, they're not gonna tell you. And some things they will not tell you because, well, you know, they're just not worth telling you, and they might be hurtful. But that's the first thing that you got to do is talk to your elders. And this day and age, you can actually record. My mother, though, bless her heart, <laughs> she didn't record. She wrote. And in fact, she documented it. She put dates down. Um, this is a handwritten letter from my mother. She's interviewing my father's oldest brother, babe. He's about eight years old, 1924. And she's interviewing them about our family history. And in this document, she reveals some things. So that's why I tell you, like, my mother never showed me, and I'm not going to tell you what this document says, but if you can turn your neck and you read it, well, I will tell you. If you turn your neck and you read it, you'll see what she says about one of the Burgesses in Coloma. Now, that picture always showed, and I was told as you look at state parks and uh, 
that my great grandfather was a blacksmith of the town in Coloma. Well, this document here says that the Black Burgess was a hangman in Coloma. Now, what I do know is that Coloma was the county seat. All the hangings occur there. I do know from research that blacksmith actually had to be proficient in tying the rope, soaking the, the rope in the, in the oil so it wouldn't break. Mother never told me that. She never told any of us that, but she wrote it down here and I found it in her documents. Why? Probably because it's hurtful. Probably because this floored me for two days when I saw it. It really did. So for other people, right, you may have had ancestors that were cruel enslavers. I'm not saying that my ancestor was a cruel hangman. Actually, when I look at the picture, that picture that you saw at the beginning, maybe you'll see it later if you look it up, the guy in the end was the jailer. And another guy that I've got deep with my great grandfather ended up being a district attorney. So as you begin to do your research, if you start looking at other people that are in close proximity, you'll find relations and you might find more information. But again, very important. And I do want to tell you guys that as you begin to do your own research and family narrative, it could be triggering. And so knowing that, just know that, hey, I didn't do it. These were different times. And I truly hope that, you know, people begin to share more records because it is extremely difficult for African Americans who didn't leave documents like mine to find out who they are, who their ancestor is. But it's not entirely difficult. Last thing I'll show you on this particular slide is the picture. Now with that Bible came this picture. And I was always told, that's your great grandfather, Rufus Burgess. Well, this is where oral narrative sometimes gets depicted. Now he may have used the name Rufus. I always question mom, why is his name Nelson Bell in the Bible, but you're telling me that's Rufus Burgess. The first time I saw who the state parks and others told me was Rufus Burgess, actually the first time my father saw him, my father said, I don't know who that man is because we've been looking at this for the last umpteen years over our fireplace and told that that's our great grandfather. Well, I'll tell you what, that man is very important. And according to his autobiography where he said he started his life, well, yes, as Nika said, you're going to have 64 if you go back far enough. Chances are he may be the great great grandfather. He may be a great 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 grandfather, considering he was born in 1795. This port picture is still in the family today. There's a handwritten note on it um, after we had it, for, well, I'd say preserved, not really restored, preserved. And uh, the note was very interesting as it was addressed almost to his first daughter. So, yeah, 1795 is the date that he says he was born around about that date in Virginia. So as we talk about oral narratives, um, older, the historical society, others, and so this is why it's very important for you guys as you do your research, go and talk to your oldest auntie, uncle, mother, grandfather that knows the history. This is a picture of where gold was discovered, okay? And some things, when they're said orally, they just can't be removed because it just becomes a part of history. Well, my... My Uncle Marin was interviewed on his 83rd birthday. And it went down in history that his father, the man shown here, at least that's proposed to be his father, tears the hillside across from where gold was discovered and actually owned the blacksmith shop. Well, he owned his blacksmith shop, sat where the community Grange Hall sits today in Coloma. And so by him recording that, and put, that almost marked it in history. Now, the park doesn't say much about it today um, as we have a conversation about reparations. The park doesn't mention much about the blacksmith shop. In fact, there is very little mention about uh, his grandfather, I mean, his father. He was a young boy when he died. But what he did say was that my father tears the hillside across from where gold was discovered. And if you look at this picture, there's only a couple of pictures, only one aerial shot of, of this era in 1946. I can't find any others. It shows all those orchards across the river. Now, I still question where the gold discovery site is, and I actually asked the question, and I'll leave this for you. Do you really think that the state would show where the gold discovery site is, the most prominent site, or would it be a reason to hide it? If you go to the Marshall Monument, you know, other documents that were held in our Bible talk about Marshall pointing to the site where gold discovery was, and he points to where the Grange Hall building sits today. So, in African-American history, 
because some didn't read and write and it became part of our culture to share things orally. My mother wrote it down. I'd say for you, you need to write it down because there are things called primary documents and secondary documents. And anytime somebody's typed and transcribed something, that's a secondary document. The primary documents, as Nikki would say, would be um, some of the legal documents from the courts that are handwritten. Even if you get a transcription that's been typed from a recording. See, I, I saw, I heard my uncle, you know, be recorded, but I saw what was typed about him and they left key parts out about how he only walked 800 yards to school or 1,000 yards based on where his home was. So as you guys do your research, make sure that you're looking at primary documents if you can find them, and that would be anything authentic. Newspaper clippings, not necessarily. It's written from a perspective. Let's go into the census, and I want to leave you guys with something as I kind of close this thing out, and that's looking at a census. Now, I, I use family search, and that was good for me. We're going to look at the 1860 census, um, and this is in Coloma, California. You can see below what I want you guys to you know, take a look at is Nelson Bell is right here in the census in 1860. They have them age 70 now. That's probably approximate. Again, many slaves didn't know their birth dates. Um, and so it was always an estimate of how old somebody was. And here's a tip for you, because I got tips and tricks. If you're doing research and you look at grave sites and they don't know a birth date, chances are this person could have been an enslaved person. I found a number of enslaved people with other European families, and I found them based on they knew birth dates for all their children. A lot of times slave owners called these enslaved people their children. And so you might find an ancestor with a white family. But here it says, Nelson Bell, labor, age uh, 70 approximately. M stands for mulatto. Um, you saw the picture of him. $600 in real estate and $1,000 assets. But over here, the column says Virginia. Okay, that's his born. Where did Nelson Bell say he was born in his autobiography? Mecklenburg County, Virginia. But on this same sense as I want to look down, I want you guys to look at something as well. Some, some, something else as well. State Park talks about Nancy and Peter Gooch. They're prominent figures in uh, Coloma history. Well, as Nika said, sometimes the names are spelled incorrectly. This is Peter Gooch, Gooch but it's Gooch. Um, age 46, again, mulatto. A gardener was a farmer for all intents and purposes during this time frame. $1,500 in real estate. And where's Peter Gooch from? I don't know if that says Virginia or Georgia. But if we look at Anne, and Anne stood for Nancy as well. They were married, didn't show a marriage, but she's a female, 38 years old. And she's from either Missouri or Maryland, can't tell where. And then there's a Patrick Holland from Virginia. And you see Edmund DeLore as well. What I want you to get from this is as you begin to look at census records, a lot of times enslaved families and people lived close to each other, especially when they're African American. This is 1860. So if I click and I go, well, I want to show these a little bit more, right? I want to zoom in on just a little bit more on these names. I see Peter here, Anne is Nancy here, looks like Missouri here, this looks like Virginia. Again, the 1860 census. So if I skip and I go, 10 years later, I'm going to go to 1870. Well, I don't see Nancy, well, I don't see a Nancy, but I do see a Rufus here, and I see a Wilson, and I see an Annie, and I see a Monroe. But didn't we have Nancy Gooch? Now, if you know the Gooch Monroe family, you would know that Nancy, Annie, is Andrew Monroe's mother. I've got a 50-year-old Annie here, and if I look, she's from Maryland or Missouri, can't remember. But Andrew, same thing, Maryland or Missouri. And this Rufus is from Tennessee. Now, Rufus is my ancestor. My point that I'm making here is this. Final tip. You will have difficulty as African Americans sometimes. My DNA ancestry is out there now. And it may be a help to all of you that are looking for your enslaved ancestor. Why? Because there were a number of black families in Coloma. And as the autobiography said, he wanted his family to know who they were, where they came from. I've got DNA matches to the Monroes. The Gucci's, I am a Burgess, but maybe not. The Williams, the Wilsons, 
the Hunts, these black families that were all in this little town, all in the little colony, I've got DNA matches. Now, how, how could that be? Well, in this case, we're talking the gold rush. And a lot of people brought their slaves here in those neighboring plantations. You know what they did? Well, once gold was discovered, you sent for other people to come here. Or you were sending to get your family members here. Nelsonville had a lot of money and had the means to send for people. That's the oral narrative that we have. Until there's something different, we have nothing more to go on than the oral narrative we piece together and we build this history as we get it. Family Search is a free site that I use to kind of connect the dots. I will tell you, the DNA ancestry is good, um, but there's also a Facebook site called I Found My Enslaved Ancestors and Their Owners. Phenomenal site, great help. A lot of people there are helpful, will give you information just to help you succeed and see who you are. That just about concludes our presentation, my presentation. I want to leave some time for Chris. Um, and questions, obviously, at the end. But this is another highlight, an up close of Rufus, Annie, and the Munros all living down near each other, listed as black. Thank you, Jonathan. I think your presentation brings up some of the um, important points and difficulties of straightening out the uh, records with what you know from your family. Um, we are going to now have our last speaker, Chris Lodgson. Thank you so much. Ah, ladies and gentlemen, we are closer to reparations right now than we've ever been, at least since the end of the Civil War, let's say. As mentioned, my name is Chris Lawson. I am one of the lead organizers with the Coalition for a Just and Equitable California, CJEC. CJEC is an amazing, amazing, amazing group of everyday Black folks, as we like to call ourselves, organizing, advocating, mobilizing for reparations and reparative justice here in the state of California. We are California's first and only, so far as we know, organization just born for reparations. Just born for reparations. That's all we do. We do reparations work and what we call reparative justice work, so stuff related to reparations. In late or middle 2019 and then into 2020, we actually helped write the final version of the law that created California's first in the nation reparations task force. That law was then called AB 3121, Assembly Bill 3121. And we are one of the seven community organizations selected by California's first in the nation reparations task force to do community outreach, community engagement, community awareness building, community education for California reparations. I've said the word reparations probably five times, six times now, seven times. We've heard the reparations said a few times earlier by my esteemed colleagues. By, by the way, big shout out to Jonathan, big shout out to Nika. I want to define the word reparations for you in a specific way so that you know what I mean when I say the word reparations as I continue to say it. And so that you have an understanding generally about what the California Reparations Task Force means when it is talking about reparations and saying the word reparations. Specifically speaking, when I say the word reparation for the next few minutes or so, what I mean is simply taking action to provide a range of benefits to survivors and descendants of some type of human rights violation. Taking action to provide a range of benefits to survivors and descendants of some type of human rights violation. In our case, those of us who descend from US slavery, the human rights violation in question is the transatlantic slave trade, the institution of slavery itself, and the things that came after, specifically the impact of those things that came after on the descendants of US slavery. Anywhere you go in the world, reparations generally has five different forms. Anywhere you go in the world, reparations generally has five different forms. Those forms are compensation, restitution, rehabilitation, guarantees of non-repetition, 
and what we call satisfaction. Compensation, restitution, rehabilitation, guarantees of non-repetition, and satisfaction. Hope I got all five of those in. Compensation is the most easily understandable part. That's the money. That's the cash. That's the check. That's the that's the income. As the the great late Dr. Martin Luther King says, we come in to get our checks. That's compensation. Restitution. That's the return of land, the return of property, the return or restoring of you to a place where you could have been or should have been had the thing that happened to you never happened to you in the first place. Restitution. Rehabilitation. These are what you might think of as the non-financial forms of reparation. So things like free medical services from cradle to the grave, free college, free legal services, et cetera, et cetera. Guarantees of non-repetition. This is what you might think of as protections or, or changing our laws, changing our policies, et cetera, et cetera, to make sure that what happened to us never happens again. And finally, satisfaction. These are what you might think of as the more symbolic forms of reparation. So changing our textbooks to make sure the history is right. Taking down racist, white supremacists, commemorations and, and monuments and, and statues and putting up what we want in their place. Compensation plus restitution plus rehabilitation plus satisfaction plus guarantees of non-repetition equals reparations. In California, the California state government and the California Reparations Task Force is considering reparations because of California's history with slavery. A lot of people don't know. A lot of people think California came into the union as a free state. That's BS. That's not true. You can't be a free state and also be a slave state at the same time. There was slavery in the state of California. I think Jonathan just talked about that. And if you talk to a lot of other folks, particularly folks at the California Reparations Task Force, through witness testimony, expert testimony, and in the first report of the California Reparations Task Force, you will see that there was indeed slavery here in the state of California. Actually, there was slavery in the same place where I'm sitting right now, here in the county of Sacramento. So California has decided that it is interested in considering reparations for its role in slavery and the things that came after slavery, what we call the legacy of slavery or the badges and incidents of slavery, the afterlife of slavery, the stuff that came after slavery, specifically the impact of those things on the descendants of US slavery. Things like racial terror, like political disenfranchisement, like what they did to us in the schools, like what they did to us in the housing, like what they did to us everywhere and anywhere else, et cetera, et cetera. In California, the California Reparations Task Force, that I'm going to give you a, a brief overview about in a couple more minutes, has decided and said, rightfully so, that those in California for whom California reparations is for are those of us who are that who are descendants of US slavery. Those of us whose ancestors came to this country not by choice, but in chains whose ancestors built the country, worked for free for 250 something plus years and then was free with nothing. That's who reparations in California is for, according to California's first in the nation state reparations task force. In 2020, 2020, Governor Gavin Newsom signed the bill that I mentioned earlier, AB 3121. The bill was written by then assembly member, Dr. Shirley Weber, now California Secretary of State, Dr. Shirley Weber. And that bill created what is still the first in the nation reparations task force, a nine member task force whose job it is to, in two years, do three things. Two years to do three things. First, study reparations with a focus on California's role with slavery, et cetera, et cetera. Second, Educate the people, educate the public, talk to the public about what it learns, and finally create what will be the first ever state reparations plan. That plan is due at the end of the two-year time. The two-year time started in June of 2021, so the final plan is due June of 2023, this summer. 
in that plan will be how much compensation, how much restitution, what types of rehabilitation, what types of guarantees of non-repetition, and what types of satisfaction. In 2022, last year, in the middle of its work, the California Reparations Task Force did two very, very important things. The first thing that it did was decide who would be eligible for reparations in California. As I just mentioned, those of us who are, who are descendants of U.S. chattel slavery and living in California right now. Why did the task force decide this? Well, first, it's in the law that created the task force itself. In the law that created the task force, it says something to the effect of, this is a task force to study and develop reparations proposals with special consideration for African Americans who are descendants of persons enslaved in the United States. Actually, that final language targeting African Americans who are, who are descendants of persons enslaved in the United States was written by folks on our, our team. Our team wrote that language into the law. So it's in the law who this is for. Also, the author of the law, Dr. Shirley Weber, when asked by the California Reparations Task Force, very clearly said to them, yes, this is for those who are descendants of U.S. slavery. This is for African Americans who are, who are descendants of U.S. slavery. It's also the case that it's just the right thing to do. Who else would we be talking about if we are doing reparations for slavery and for the things that came after slavery? Who else would we be talking about? And finally, in our estimation, in our judgment, in our belief, and according to the advice that the State Reparations Task Force got legally and constitutionally, and I'm sure as some of y'all know, in California and nationally, race-based, all Black people policies, programs, benefits are almost certainly illegal and almost certainly unconstitutional. They clearly almost certainly violate the state's constitution under Proposition 209, clearly almost certainly violate the, for, excuse me, the 14th Amendment, but also Title IV of the Civil Rights Act. So that's partly why the State Reparations Task Force decided that those of us who are descendants of U.S. slavery would be those who are eligible for reparation. That's the first big thing the task force did last year. The second big thing the task force did last year was release its final, excuse me, its interim report, its middle report, its halftime report in June of 2022. And that report, it's about 500 pages long. It documents all of the what the task force learned in its first year of work. And that report is available online right now at the California Reparations Task Force website. It's also available at our website, also www.cjec-official.org. You can find the report there. One other thing that I want to be very clear and very intentional about sharing with you is what happens next. What happens after the task force finishes its final plan and final report due in June of this year. That report, that plan then goes to the state Senate, goes to the state assembly, goes to the governor for consideration for reparations legislation, hopefully as early as this time next year. So my expectation is that this time next year, we will be working through the first ever state reparations legislation making its way through the state of California government. Well, last thing I'll say here, and then I wanna make sure we leave time for your questions. Last thing I'll say here is this, in relationship to what my esteemed colleagues are talking about, about how you demonstrate that you are a descendant of US slavery. One thing the state reparation task force actually just made sure will be in the final plan just over the last 72 hours at the last reparations task force hearings over the weekend or Friday and Saturday that just passed here in Sacramento was the creation of something called, what we're calling CAFA, C-A-A-F-A, -A, the California African-American Freedmen Agency. This agency will be responsible for providing direct services and oversight of all things California reparations related as we go forward 
into actual reparations, but also sat inside of this new agency will be something called the Office of Genealogy. And this will be the place where those of us who are descendants will be able to show and demonstrate that we are descendants of US slavery, along with the help and support of great folks like Nika and Jonathan, et cetera, et cetera, folks who do this kind of work for a living. So I'm gonna stop there. I wanna appreciate you and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, some, you know, I think we're gonna be hearing a lot more about this and uh, there's obviously a lot to discuss um, and there's been so much great information here tonight. Um, we've had a really lively chat. Um, I think I've really never seen it go off like this before. So people are, um, are participating. I want you guys to know that if you haven't been looking at it. Um, we have some questions. I'm going to answer the first one just because it's a little bit of um, kind of housekeeping. Um, one of the audience members asks if the questions will be included in the recording. And the questions that we ask, ask and answer live here um, in this part of the program will be um, part of the recording. Um, I'll try, I noticed that Nika, you answered a few, so we may, if we have time, we'll try to get to just to, to raise them here so that they are part of the recording. Um, one of our first questions that came in was, what about church records? Are those useful? Yeah, uh, church records can be useful, um, number one, in the, in the context of what we're talking about. Um, slaveholders would bring their enslaved to church um, and would do things like baptize them. Um, and, and sometimes you even would see marriages, things like that. Um, it's very prevalent in states like Louisiana where Catholicism reigns supreme. Um, and so you would even see people have their names changed, all that kind of stuff. Um, so yes, those records can provide clues, but I think a, a sort of the way that you're supposed to do genealogy, the step for naturally with some folks would be, would be to look at the black church um, and see where the seeds of that came from. Because a lot of times uh, black churches that were started during reconstruction were actually spinoffs of white churches that those members were, or, were a part of during the enslavement time period. So that may, that may also be a clue for you. Thank you. Um, can you claim reparations for more than one state? I'll jump in there. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> uh, so right now, California is the first state to do this, and you know. So, and I am hopeful that other states will will follow suit. So right now, the answer is there's only one state that you would be able to claim them from right now, which is California. Ultimately, though, what we want to see, and by we, I mean folks at the at the coalition and even the California Reparations Task Force, which discussed this just this last weekend at their final hearing, or excuse me, at their last hearings, was that ultimately what we want to see is the federal government actually do a national reparations program. Actually, one of the other things that our coalition had written into the bill back in 2020 was, I think like it's the last paragraph or last two paragraphs, something that says something to the effect of, just because California is doing this doesn't mean the federal government isn't responsible for doing something nationally too. And that is something that we still firmly believe that the national government is ultimately responsible for a national reparations program. But right now to the, to the question, again, the only state you, can, you could claim reparations from or the first state that you'll be able to claim reparations from are, is the state of California. I'll also add that cities, so it's really three layers. <laughs> <laughs> because it's local, state, and federal. And depending on what they determine are the parameters, which says that could be three different sets of parameters, um, we would hope it would be unified in terms of what is required. But, you know, that, that has yet to remain to be seen. So just keep your eyes glued on the task force. It's probably a good policy. Yeah. And if I may, Aaron, I'll just add this is that, you know, based on what Nika said and Chris, um, just in my history, I can show not only did the local level have a hand in wrongdoings, but the state and the federal, all three. And so even the private entities had a hand in the wrongdoing of you know ancestors and, and people that were here in California, what was supposed to be a free state. So um, 
Yeah, all three. Four. And I'm, I'm noticing, just to um, follow up on this question a little bit further, I'm noticing several questions that are about if you moved here from another state, are you eligible? If you leave California, are you eligible in California? And um, yeah, questions along those lines. And how much, how long must a person live in California to be eligible for reparations? I can help there. Some of it, some of it still be to be determined, but as it stands right now, if you move to California, but you have at least one ancestor who was enslaved somewhere in these United States, so and you're and you're a current California resident, then you are you are still eligible. So I'll use myself as an example. I am originally from the state of New York. My ancestors were enslaved, I believe, in at least on my mother's side in Georgia and Alabama. I have at least one ancestor who was enslaved in this country, and I'm a current California resident. So I am eligible for reparations in the state of California. So if you move from somewhere else, but you have an enslaved ancestor who was enslaved somewhere in the United States and are now a California resident, you are eligible according to what the California Reparations Task Force has said so far. If you left California though, and you have an ancestor who was enslaved in this country by this country, but you are no longer a California resident. Right now, you are not eligible, at least as far as what the California Reparations Task Force has said so far. Uh, there's still work to be done, done on that, and they're still working to determine whether or not that will be sort of the final final recommendation. But as, as it stands right now, they have not made a determination that you will be eligible if you left California, but you do have an ancestor who was enslaved in this country. And then to the last question, or last piece to this, the California Reparations Task Force is still debating how long you have you would have had to be a California resident. And actually, over the weekend, there was this debate around and um, among the task force itself around residency versus domicile. So your residency may be a little bit different from your domicile status. So you know, we have folks who, you know, are residents for a short amount of time, or whether, you know, college students, military, et cetera. And so there's a there's a discussion going on with the task force members itself publicly now about whether or not there should be a residency requirement or a domicile requirement. That's still to be determined. I'll also throw in there that Chris qualifies, but I don't, even though I lived in the state of California for 33 years. Interesting. <laughs> Yes. Just for, <laughs> just, right. Just for, just just for, just for just like, come, come back. Right. Come back. I, Nika, come back. Right. Right. Like come back. Right. Like he's like. Right. He's like. Come back. Come back. Right. So yeah. This is an interesting question. Does reparations, as it is being brought about, include any effort to create a corporate enslavement penalty? Depends on what the that means, corporate enslavement penalty. I'm not sure exactly what that means. Um, so I won't want to answer because I'm not sure exactly what a corporate enslavement penalty means. If we could get some more information about that. Okay, fair enough. Um, let's see. Oh, I, okay. Can I opine? Because this person can't talk, but I'm imagining they probably are likening... Um, you know how like the state of California has the list of insurance companies that were involved in the slave trade and they had to publish lists, right? Which in some ways people would maybe consider that a penalty that they had to publish the information. Sometimes it could be monetary, you know what I mean? Like would there be, right, that's what I'm thinking they're asking, but you know, don't let me put words in people's mouths. I'm just, you know, opining. Chris, do you have anything on that? No? Yeah, just, uh, I was th thanks, I was going to jump in. So uh, the State Reparations Task Force has been very focused on state responsibility and state culp culpability. Doesn't mean they can't include in the final plan ways to encourage some private and corporate culpability. Doesn't mean legislators in the state couldn't say, hey, in addition to making sure that our state holds itself responsible and accountable. We want to get some, some accountability and participation and contribution from our corporate citizens also. But so far, the State Reparations Task Force has really been focused on what the state itself is, is responsible for. Okay, thank you. Um, and this might be a question for any one of you, but is there a central repository for information about enslaved people in California? 
I have information on many people not related to me and would be happy to share if there is a resource where it can be accessed by others to build their claims. Can I jump in real quick here and then definitely hear from my colleagues on this, but um, I don't know the answer. I, I'm assuming from what Nika said earlier, the answer might be no. Um, so I don't know that there is one, but I will say that part of what this reparations plan or potential plan that the state is working on now, particularly through the California African American Freedmen Agency, particularly through the Office of Genealogy, part of what there, part of what may come through from this and come out of this may be what will be the first ever state or modern day state level registry, state level list of folks who are current descendants of US slavery and even some of the, you know, some of who their some of who who their ancestors are. So if there's not one now, there may be one coming. Jonathan, I would imagine. Oh, okay, go oh sorry. Go ahead, Jonathan. Go ahead. No, I mean, I was going to say, yeah, that, um, I was not aware of there being anything central, like Nika said, but that information is extremely valuable. And I'm glad that that person at least asked that question. Um, I know that, you know, I would definitely want to be in contact with that individual, um, with my involvement with CJAC and with this push for reparations. And Nika may have some uh, referrals as well, too. So. Um, that, yeah, I, we, I noticed in the chat, I'm sorry, Nika, I noticed in the chat that um, some people asked where they could reach you. So maybe um, if you are comfortable with being contacted, maybe you could just state, each of you could just state um, how, what the best way to, to um, be contacted would be or to type it into the chat. Right, and while you're doing that, I'll go ahead and read this sort of long one. Um, I am the genealogist of my family, both sides, and I really appreciate the genealogist presentation. I have been to the Coloma Valley in the 1970s and hope that there is more American history, Black California, bravo, Mr. Burgess, and your brother and family for the documented history. Moreover, I have participated in all of the California Black Reparations meetings. A sincere thank you, Mr. Lodgson. Let me... Let me add some other facts that might affect Black ancestry research. My mother just died at 98. She interviewed her grandmother, age 106, in 1932. Um, this person describes uh, many of the things that they have. Um, comment to consider. My grandpa was the Indian agent and married the Choctaw chief's daughter, and our Choctaw relatives had slaves and are listed as mulatto. Something to consider when doing your research. My six white great-grandfathers lived with my great-grandmothers. So, okay, I'm not sure the question in there, but I have noticed other questions about, um, you know, Native American ancestry and how that could affect, um, you know, African-American genealogy research and or um, claims for reparations. It's actually easier. Me, me and Chris have had a conversation about this. Um, in fact, yeah, I know, we're totally, we're totally sidebarring in the middle of the section. But um, here's the thing, um, in terms of geography, California um, and other states such as uh, Washington State or even Kansas and Missouri have large populations of people who are considered freedmen of the five tribes. Those are individuals whose ancestors were formerly enslaved by the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Muscogee Creek, and Seminole nations. And because of that, um, and because of statehood in Oklahoma in 1907, where lands from the nations were apportioned out evenly to create the state of Oklahoma, those of us that have freedmen ancestry um, have records such as the Dawes cards, D-A-W-E-S, that list our ancestor slaveholders. So the journey that I discussed earlier where um, you know you might have to kind of bring together all the sum of all parts to find out a slaveholder or you know to find out if your ancestors were enslaved, those of us who have ties to the five tribes can get to that information usually within three to four generations. Um, with that said, um, that's nation specific, that's Oklahoma specific. We gotta remember structures and hierarchy in the country. You've got your local state level, you know, town, city, right? Then you've got your state, then you've got your federal stuff. So, um, you know, I think the the conversation around um, Freedmen of the Five Tribes is a very nuanced one. I think few people make an assumption that those of us that have connections to the nations received our reparations. 
Um, when in reality, if you really follow our story, you know that we have been literally fighting for citizenship in these nations since the treaties of 1866. Um, and that a lot of us are only really considered safe because we have a chief that supports freedmen, um, that being the Cherokee Nation. Um, so with that said, um, there definitely is a larger conversation around freedom of the five tribes in respect to the state of California. Um, but it don't don't look at it as a um, an alternative. We're black in the nation and we're black outside of it. And you know, where we where I have one grandparent that's from Oklahoma, the other three are from Arkansas, Louisiana. So, you, you know, I, I think we sometimes want to bucket ourselves. Go back to that slide where I talked about not all of your ancestors come from the exact same place in Africa. They come from different locations. We as African-American people also have that lived experience due to the great migration in the United States as well. Um, so don't bucket. When you start bucketing, then yeah, <laughs> just don't bucket. <laughs> um, and I noticed Chris added something in the chat about um native americans enslaving african americans um correct that, that that's what's implied um within the five tribes was chattel slavery and people think that it was better or um you know somehow more advantageous when there were slave codes there were slave uprisings all of that took place in the indian territory which is in um, Eastern Oklahoma, as well as more than 3,000 enslaved people were a part of the Trail of Tears. Okay. Um, I, this, uh, this audience member asks, can I, I can prove my link to slavery due to my relation to Harriet Tubman. Will that make it easier for me to claim reparations? Depends on what you consider and what your paper is. As the task force is de developing, you know, the criteria, one of the things I talked about this more on an episode of Black Gen is our idea of proof and how that, you know, kind of coalesces with what a government entity would consider to be proof. Um, and so the thing is, you know, while our culture is largely oral, when you have to provide proof, people want it to be in paper trail for. And so that in some ways can potentially come into collision, the, the task force would have to weigh, right, um, you know, what that looks like, um, considering uh, just cultural stuff that we have around that. So, um, you know, it, it's one thing to hear the history and to have that story passed down. It's another thing to be able to substantiate it on paper. And a lot of us have that challenge, but it doesn't mean that it's impossible. If I could add quickly, and I, I'm so glad Nika, Nika said that because she's absolutely right. And it depends on how the process for demonstrating that you are a descendant of U.S. slavery is designed. So it really depends on how it's designed. And we're very early in the process now. So, you know, there are a bunch of great ideas about how best to design it. So that, and this is my, you know, my personal goal is that 100% of those who are descendants ultimately receive reparations here in California. I think that's the, that's the goal that I think we all want. We all want everyone who is a descendant of U.S. slavery to be eligible and, and to, and to actually receive reparations. And so how you design a program that actually gets us to that, there are ways to design it that make it harder. There are ways to design it that make it simpler. And so right now, you know, I think the task force and ultimately what we expect will be, you know, the part of this sort of state office will have to design a plan I would like that that is actually able to get to that goal to make sure we get 100% of those who are, who are eligible actually their reparation. So it really depends on how it's designed. And it's really too early to say what records or, or, or what, what forms of, of proof will be um, acceptable because the task force hasn't said that yet. Okay, thank you. Um, well, since we wanted to make sure that we were, that this program really gave people a lot of resources, I want to pick up a question um, that Nika answered, uh, you know, via typing. Um, it was posed, is there a link to any of the slave manifests that you can share? Um, Nika, do you want to talk about the New Orleans 
Yeah, there are a couple of bases that inc- that have inward and outward slave manifests. Again, you know, it's it's the shippers would be on there. You would also see the receivers. And you also, when you start going through these collections, see the largest slave traders in the country, such as John um, Franklin, uh, Franklin Armfield and Ballard, where they're literally shipping people from the upper south in Virginia and Maryland down to Louisiana and Mississippi, et, et cetera. So um, you have the New Orleans uh, inward and outward manifest that's in one collection. And then you also have the others for states like Alabama, um, Georgia, and I want to say South Carolina that are in another collection. Um, all of those are available on Ancestry. And, and I believe they're also on Family Search as well. Um, and the date ranges, again, this is covering a very isolated time period and it's not every manifest. People see a collection and they think it's everything. It's not everything. Not everything exists. Not everything survived. So um, I will copy and paste the link in the chat as well. Well, thank you. We're just about at time here, and I want to make sure that I just really tell you how um, appreciative I am of the three of you being here tonight and discussing this with us. I think there's going to be follow up and um, more discussion on this topic in the uh, months to come. Um, and I hope that CHS will be able to do um, some of the programming around that. Um, thank you to our audience as well for joining us. We really appreciate you. Um, I think we're putting some links in the uh, chat about how you can register for our future programs um, that we have on our calendar. Our next program is called Emily and Matilda Bancroft, Women Writers in Their Own Right with author Kim Bancroft. That will be on uh, March 21st um, via Zoom, at, also at 5.30 p.m. So again, thank you so much, Nika, Chris, and Jonathan for joining us. I so appreciate your being here with us tonight. Thank you. Good night, everyone.